Oh, everybody's in here. Oh, that's great. All right. So that will be the, uh, the place then. Uh, so thanks first. Uh, I'd like to thank Ellie and Bill Tucker, our executive producers. Uh, yeah. who, Uh, without, without their fundraising, the production would be uh, uh, I'd like to thank the Old Town School of Music in Chicago, WTTW Public Television in Chicago, Georgia Humanities in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development through funding from the Georgia General Assembly, Frank Hamilton himself, and Christy Showers. Uh, My wife, Carol Moser, who learned to be a, who learned to be an associate producer and did it splendidly, and it also huge help in getting this, uh, bringing all, all this tonight. And finally, uh, folk singer Michael Jonathan of Lexington, Kentucky, uh, maybe I, I would have to say responsible for this film happening because uh, Michael kept nagging me to do it. He said, You're, you have a background in public television, filmmaking, you should do a film on Frank Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then eventually when I heard that Burt Elliott and some other people at the school were interested in getting some, uh, some uh, oral history reported on a video with Frank, we got in touch and started thinking maybe we could do something more ambitious and brought Bob Judson uh, into the mix, and five years later, here we are. So, some introductions. I am one of three producers, uh, and I was the script writer. Uh, the other two producers are Bob Judson and Bert Elliott. Bob. Uh, And Bob is also the director and editor. During the course of his career, Bob has produced over 500 programs for various television and digital distribution platforms, directing many of them. During his tenure as ma managing director of GSU TV, that department won honors including five Southeast Emmy Awards, 18 International Tele Awards, and two first place awards in the COP International Film Festival. Bob has produced and directed for TNT, NBC, Time Life Television, Discovery Channel, The Learning Channel, National Geographic, MGM Television, Channel 4 London. Uh, Bert Elliott is the sound designer. Bert brings to the project his many years in film and video production and musical experience, from the stage to the studio, with the ability to bring together musicians and ideas. Some of Bert's most inspiring work includes three Grammy-nominated album projects with the legendary jazz guitarist Earl Club, and corporate clients have included Delta Airlines, U.S. Airways, America West Airlines, IBM, Georgia, Lo Georgia Lottery, uh, NBC Sports, and others. Uh, Rachel Clara Donaldson, is, uh, uh, who you saw in the film, is curator of collections and exhibitions at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Her background is in U.S. history, specializing in social and labor history and historic preservation. She holds a Master of Historic Preservation degree from the University of Maryland College Park and Ph.D. in history from Vanderbilt University. In her book, I Hear America Singing, which was adapted for her Ph.D. dissertation, uh, she traces the vibrant history of the 20th century folk music revival from its origins in the 1930s to its end uh, in the late 1960s. The other member of our panel is Frank Hamilton, who I guess has been pretty well in the um, Okay, so I'm going to have a seat and uh, entertain questions. Who would like to come up first? In regards to Americana music and what would it take to make it popular? You know, for a while, Sirius XM had a whole They've got like uh, eight different country stations on Sirius. Uh, and for a while there was a folk music station came out of, uh, I think, Rockville, Maryland. I can't remember the name of who did it, but uh, but it's, it, it's all God, you know. And for a while, Bob, Bob Dylan was actually emceeing uh, one of their stations. Uh, is there any, any ferment on this occurring again? 
Well, they, um, the phone channel we'll call the village is still on Sirius XM on a line, uh, if you get it on the internet. They just didn't have the bandwidth. It wasn't popular enough, apparently, to put it on, uh, to keep it on the radio channel. Okay, I had to say that WRFG, Radio Free Georgia, 89.3 FM is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, and we have folk, they, I'm not on the staff anymore or anything, but uh, they have folk music, they have Americana every weekday night, I think at 8 o'clock, 10, and when, when I moved here in 66, there was one folk a, a short folk program on uh, the Georgia State Station, actually, because they had a folklore professor. But that was it. And um, there wasn't much anywhere else either. But please, 89.3 FM, WRFG.org, you can look up the schedule. And there's folk music every, I think, other Tuesday guy does a program called What the Folk. <laughs> and, uh, you know, other weird stuff. Um, Sunday night from 7 to 10. It's another good show. Laura McCarty of Georgia Minutes. Hey, Brian, so who is, who all the people that you played with would you consider your biggest influence? Um, oh, gosh, that's a hard one. They're all influences. I mean, you can't hang out with Woody and not be influenced. <laughs> you know, everybody was an influence. Everybody I met in the whole folk music field has been an influence because we influence each other. You know, we share our music, and that's where it's at. First of all, this film is absolutely magnificent. I, 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 the question is, is, uh, is uh, tell us a little bit about, about how it got started and, and uh, you know, where you did things like your production activities and, and all that work that obviously went into it. it. It was really fantastic effort, and I'm so glad that we came down here tonight to see it. Thank you. It got started when uh, Bert and I began talking about doing something more ambitious than just recording uh, some oral history for Frank. And as I went down, I, I guess it was Bert who maybe told me about Bob Judson, uh, who was with GSU TV at the time, and, and, uh, and they had produced a number of pro pro uh, programs in, in folk music. And uh, Bob warmed to the idea of a documentary on Frank. Bob, Bert, you want to pick it up from there? Sure. Well, I was selfish in wanting to make this film because I've known both uh, Frank and Grandma Jack Elliott for over 25 years, and I knew that it was important to get their, not just their story out there, but in these precarious times when, you know, we all need a voice and, and everybody needs to raise their voice. This is the type of music that's true and it comes from the heart. And it does motivate people, and it moves people. Frank moves people, Jack moves people. Jack is 91 years old and still touring. Yeah. You know? and, and Frank's still out there doing it as well. So, you know, that, that's commitment to something that that is very important that day. I mean, you, you get fed all these very depressing news stories every morning, and you need something uplifting. And this is the type of music that's uplifting. So, you know, it, it, was a, it was a natural fit. It was, uh, something that needed to be done. Uh, we raised our first, first funds through a crowdfunding campaign that went through Michael Jonathan's uh, organization, Wood Songs Inc., Wood Songs Front Porch Association Inc. And so we took what little money we had and, and put it on the screen and, and uh, worked in bits and pieces at it. Uh, made road trips, including up to Old Town School in Chicago in December uh, before last, um, and uh, just did it on faith. Bert, you want to? Yeah, I can maybe give a little more history to it. Um, the whole thing started out when we found out that Frank had cancer. And David McCullough, who's sitting here somewhere, knew that I was doing some oral history type productions and came to me and asked me if I would do a story on Frank. And of course I said, I mean, of course. Uh, Frank and I go back 40 years. And, uh, but that's how it started. And then uh, 
uh, we find out that Chris was uh, contacted by Michael, and uh, we decided we'd all put it all together. But have to give some credit to uh, to David because um, yeah. yes. that's where it all bloomed from. Which is and David's a, a, a dear friend of Frank's for many years. Absolutely. Yeah. And as all you aspiring filmmakers know, the 800-pound uh, gorilla in the room is all, always the budget. <laughs> um, you never have enough. You, you know, no matter how much you have, you never have enough. But you, you, you want to bring something to fruition in the best way that you can. And um, you know, we brought on a wing and a prayer at the beginning. That's just using our own resources, I have resources, for have resources, Chris is writing. Um, and then uh, Bill and Ellie came along and uh, led us, you know, down the path to uh, the money we needed to, you know, get it done. So, a lot of credit. To finish up, when I was getting at as far as Frank having cancer, well, luckily Frank kicked cancer, right? <laughs> We don't know how he still continues on, but he does. And uh, oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> but um, so all this was going on right when COVID hit, and so all of our great ambitions kind of halted, in, like everyone's lives did. Mm -hmm. uh, so Frank and I ended up doing multiple Zoom sessions mm -hmm. because Frank has a little recording set up at his home so I could get some good audio from him. And that's how the uh, pre-production pieces that we did, and there's quite a few of them actually that we'll share with the school and maybe someday they'll get on the website or something, but there's um, many, many stories if we weren't able to get in the film. We only had 60 minutes. And and uh, kudos to Bob Judson here for, for getting as much in as he did. Well, Frank, that was a really good Thank you, sweetie. documentary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I like how you included everything from the grassroots of folk in, into what you're doing now. But I was talking to one of your panelists and I was asking her about the different categories that folk has went. You know, I'm so used to the folk that you're talking about. And there, are, and then you did put the hip hop folk kind of stuff in there. But I was wondering how can we get this grassroots folk back alive? in a sense, you know, young people now pick up the guitar and they play their music and they say they ain't doing folk and I say, okay, you doing folk, but it's not the folk that I'm from, you know, the folk that's telling the history, the folk that is um, expressing what's going on today. So how do we take the folk music you're talking about and get it into the hands of a young people. I hear you. I think the future of folk music is not on the concert stage. It's in the living rooms. It's in the, it's in the homes of people who like to get together and make music together. And it's in places like our school where people can come and, and just be themselves and, and exercise their birthright, which is music. And uh, I think we have to look away from the stage and the spotlight and the star system and look to the people because they'll always make the folk music. We don't have to do anything. It's going to be around. The only problem is finding out where it is. We got to do the homework. We got to find out who's singing, who's playing, and what they have to say. And, and, and you should go hear Veronica in her concerts. She's wonderful. She's a, she's a lovely performer. The right song. And there's so many people in this country that are so talented that they never really come to, we don't know who they are. We don't know who they are. So we have to do our homework. And if we find people like Veronica or anybody who has their uh, talent so obvious and 
is in is in the it's in our interest to support them and cultivate them. And also, everybody here has a musical talent. You probably didn't know that before. <laughs> but one of the things about talent is it overrated. If you have an interest in music and you love it, then you are talented in music. That's the bottom line. All it's a matter of doing it's just getting down there and playing and singing and doing it. But you all have the talent. And I think Sparks who said it at the beginning of the film. That's the reason we put it at the beginning of the film. You know, it's the young people that have to carry the torch forward. And it's it's people like Rising Appalachia, you know, who not only go out there and play on the stage, they play at festivals, they play at churches, they play nonprofit. They spent six weeks at Standing Rock mm -hmm. with the indigenous people singing and supporting them. That's, you know, so, you know, they're out there and you have to give them support, like Frank said. You have to, you know, seek them out, you know, to come and partner with them and support them. Well, you want to know something about the history? I'm going to, I think we should hear from Rachel. Because Rachel, Rachel's our historian. Uh, yeah, Rachel, you, you came into... Hang on, let me just say one thing to finish this up before okay. you go on. Because uh, Veronica, is it? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Um, and everyone else, if you're looking for some new, really cool, be, be, besides Appalachia, uh, you know, um, look into Black Opera. Opera. Black, Black Opera. Opera. Yeah. Right? And um, there's some incredible uh, young black artists doing this old folks uh, music and different types that you, uh, it, it blew me away when I saw mm -hmm. how much different genres they're throwing into folk music. That's one that's one place to work. That's the future of America. That's the future of America. Black opera. Uh, Rachel, you came into the study of the American folk revival not as a musicologist but as a as a labor historian. And and you made some comments uh, some of your comments are in the film about uh, the belief held by generations of folk revivalists that folk music could help popularize an understanding of Americanism grounded in cultural pluralism and, and American democracy. Would you like to ex expand on that? Sure, thank you. Well, thank you for having me, and it's a pleasure to be here in Eleanor. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so my work really kind of looks at the origins of the revival um, going back to the early 20th century, but really taking off in the 1930s, and how um, left wing activists really used folk music as a way to show that American identity is rooted in democracy and what can be more democratic art form than folk music. And so you have people like, you know, the like Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie and the Almanac singers who are really using music that's they're like, you know, folk music is by the people, you know, and for the people. So that's when you get this kind of political spin from a musical perspective. But at the same time you also have Un unambiguously uh, uh, political actors also tapping into this music. People like uh, Lawrence Geller, who was a communist activist in um, New York and North Carolina. And when he was down in North Carolina, he uh, started um, listening to songs among um, black musicians. And because he was, again, a communist, <laughs> he was kind of able to, to infiltrate and do this kind of underground. Um, and he discovered that there was a clear political protest in this music. And so he publishes a book called Negro Songs of Protest. And this is to show people that, you know, this inherent American art form also has this inherent political protest to it. Um, so getting that music out there um, beyond the rural, circle, rural circles and into things like the labor movement. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so this is the, the idea of kind of introducing people to their heritage and saying that this is not just music, it's not just culture, um, but it is, it is our national identity and, um, and it's something that's, that's rooted in this, this democratic heritage. Uh, Frank, uh, could you expand on how far back in history the connection between folk music and, and social commentary and protests go back I mean, centuries before even Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger. And I'm thinking of the German song you referenced in the film. I'm thinking of British broadside ballads, you know, back to the, the, the dawn of the printing press. Could well, you talk about that. 
Pete Seeger is responsible for a lot of our history. And uh, he, uh, in the 15th century, I think it was, uh, yeah. under uh, uh, the, uh, uh, let me see, uh, I'm, uh, well, anyway, <laughs> one of the first protest songs was from Germany in the 15th century, called Digge Duncan sind frei. And my thoughts are free. And it was sung by the immigrant, um, by the uh, uh, farmers in Germany at that time. And I think it was, uh, let's see, who was the, uh, uh, Giberti Scores, who was that? Uh, the, uh, this, not St. Saint, Saint Augustine, who was it? Yeah, like we're going to know, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you'll know the name if I, if I bring it up. Pardon me if I have a little, little cobweb in the brain there. But, but, uh, but this was one of the first protest songs ever, ever uh, collected. And of course, Pete knew about it. and. Uh, he was one that brought it to the fore. Uh, as far as the the uh, the depth of American folk music, I, I I think you have to say that folk music is is a part of people's music, and that we called it folk music because that was a convenient way to put it into the record bins when the uh, commercial music merchants wanted to sell it. But folk music is a lot broader than what I knew when I was growing up in it. Uh, I always thought it was traditional music from people from an agrarian culture. And then my whole idea, uh, my whole perception of it changed when I began getting around and meeting and playing with people who had different interests. I'm a, I'm a big jazz nut. I love jazz. And uh, I, love, uh, I love all kinds of music. And uh, uh, I was fortunate to be able to play with various people playing not just folk music, but some jazz, some classical, but it's all people's music. And if people own it and, uh, and perform it and are a part of it, that's so terribly important. One thing I really feel is important, and that is if you own the music, which you should do, if you own it personally, then it will perpetuate. It will go on. If you go to see a performer, and you have played the guitar or played the whatever instrument you are, and you hear that person in conjunction with your own personal, own personal establishment with the music. That means that you've given that performer a tribute, and you have internalized the music as, as your birthright, as something that you, you essentially have inside of you. So that's very important, I think, because we, we're so into the star system, and uh, the way to get around that is for you to take it up, is to make it your own. The music is your own. If you go to see a performer, it's not the performer's music that you're listening to. It's your music, mm -hmm. because it's what you're bringing to that music. Um, in coming back to what's happening now, there's something that started at the beginning of the pandemic called the Daily Antidote of Song. Yeah, yeah every day at noon, this started in uh, March, I think, right after the pandemic started. Um, one song leader leads a song, and people can come on and Zoom, they can go on Facebook, they're also recorded, you can look at them anytime. But it was the idea of that people are shut in and um, by the pandemic, but there's also a lot of people that are shut in in general. And on New Year's Eve day, they passed day 1,000 of a song every single day. And people, every day there's like 75 to 100 people right there in the Zoom room. They, um, the host sings or says or sings hello to every single person in the room and teaches a song. It's not about performing, it's about teaching and you see and you start to get to know the people in the room and it's an amazing thing and I think it speaks exactly to that. Um, idea. You, you all should know this lady, she's a very important part of my community. You know, you can also go to Roger McGuinn's Folk Den. Yeah. Who he's been since 20 years or so. Yeah. And uh, has been putting a song a week or a month out. Yeah. 
And that's a great source. It's a great source. And also, uh, playing for change, which is pretty amazing. I mean, these are musicians all over the world taking songs like Robbie Robinson's Wade and, and traditional songs, Bob Marley songs, and, and you know, they're, they're playing music around the world, but it really does give you a sense of that kind of international camaraderie that, that music brings. Uh, a few of us here tonight have had the pleasure of taking uh, a couple terms of classes with Frank on protest songs. Uh, and it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, and every night we meet, Frank says, we got to take these songs to the street. You know, <laughs> we got to get them out. We got to get them out. And we must have learned a hundred songs. And, Someone asked about when did it start. I mean, we, we, we were learning revolutionary tea, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and the way folk music has evolved, I mean, if you listen to uh, Sharon Jones sing, This Land is Your Land, it's a rock and beat. It's a, it's a, you know, kind of a whole different genre that's kind of grown out. You got people like Rihanna Gibbons that's really, um, you know, taking things to a different level. But... Uh, I'm uh, semi-retired, uh, trying to be retired, uh, high school social studies teacher. And, and Frank said, you know, it all just kind of clicked because it was all history. And, you know, Frank was kind of there for a lot of it and brought that uh, richness to us in the class. And so uh, we, are, we are starting to put together a group of us from that class that uh, are reaching out to you know, schools and engagement of kids in a, like a social studies classroom is always an issue, you know, they'd rather be someplace else. <laughs> but with these songs, uh, it's a whole new deal. You know, they, 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 we start singing, we start looking at, say, you know, the Underground Railroad and follow the drinking gourd. And then you've got like, you've got astronomy in there, you've got singing, you've got history, you've got, you know, uh, a whole sorts of all sorts of a uh, uh, you know multi-dimensional uh, uh, activities. So we are starting uh, to do this program to bring um, reach out to schools, and then we're going to go to uh, retirement homes and prisons and churches and wherever we can find uh, that people are interested in it, and uh, uh, you know. Frank was always uh, kind of clear to, uh, to say in our class, well, we don't really have an agenda, sort of maybe, but, you know, there it has an agenda, it's social change and justice and equality and all like that. So uh, that's kind of an exciting program. If any of you kind of have some, some, some thought in your mind, oh, this could, this could be a great program for wherever you are, if you're involved in a school educational or community center, uh, it's, we're trying to put this uh, group together. And uh, we learned a lot of songs, and uh, a lot of it refers to civil rights. A lot of it goes back to civil war, even the Revolutionary War. It's great for history and, and engagement for kids, and then kind of looking at the, uh, critically what was going on uh, culturally at, during these times. So. Uh, you can talk to Mara, Frank, or myself about uh, getting involved with that if you have any uh, ideas. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say two things about, about the, the number one is that the school is not an advocate. We embrace all different kinds of viewpoints. I figure, to me, if people could learn to pick and sing together, they can learn to talk to one another. <laughs> Uh, the other thing is that I really want kids to be involved. Kids are so important. If we don't have kids here, we don't have a future. Uh, just one thing uh, before I entertain, we entertain your question, just on the subject of protest songs. Uh, the, it's a tradition that goes back, you mentioned, you mentioned the, the German song, and also um, it, it, at the dawn of the age of the printed word, the printing press, and people broadside balladeers 
were writing a songs of social protest and commentary and the news of the day and printing them up on penny sheets and hawking them in the streets in the British Isles. And they were writing them and then they would set them to the tunes of traditional folk ballads. And that's later on, that's what Robert Burns did. Later on from that, that's what Woody Guthrie did, Bob Dylan, Joan, yeah. Can, can I add yes, something please to this? Add to that. Um, so this is really interesting that you're doing this project um, because uh, in 1952, I think it was in the first one, and double check the date, um, but um, Boba's Records released American History in Ballad and Song. Um, and so this was a whole project about presenting um, like an uh, understudied, I don't want to say alternative history because it was obviously there, but a view of history that wasn't represented in textbooks um, and the like. And so looking at the abolition movement, looking at you know, early civil rights activism, looking at the, you know, women's rights, I mean, before second wave feminism. So this is, like, this is a really ahead of its time. And they had a couple albums, one for elementary school students and one for um, high school students, so it was kind of age appropriate. And um, what's so fascinating is because this is happening during the Red Scare. So this is something that wouldn't necessarily be in classrooms because people were monitoring textbooks. They were monitoring what would go on in classrooms, but they weren't monitoring libraries. And so libraries, librarians were the unsung heroes getting this history out there, and Both Ways Records specifically marketed this, not to classrooms, but to libraries. So, so there's even a, a roots of this, this effort. I have a follow-up question to you about it. Uh, that in a moment, but please, your, your question. So it was great to see the pictures. For those of us who spent the 60s walking through some street or other carrying candles <laughs> trying to stop the Vietnam War, it was wonderful. And so a technical question, how do you get all that old footage? How does that work technically? Where is all this located? Wow, why don't you take the internet? That and, you know, um, people are really, really willing to share nowadays. If they find out you're doing a project like this project, you'd be surprised what you know comes out of steam and trunks and and you know Library of Congress, um, you know, all the usual suspects. Um, there, there's a lot out there, you know. Um, we're not making any money on this, we're doing this as an educational show, so a lot of fair news comes into play. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, I want to get back to the Red Scare. Uh, look, uh, and, and we talked in the film about how folk revivalists uh, left with reputations that had been somewhat acceptable to the public uh, in the 30s and 40s, caused them a lot of trouble in the 50s, blacklists and so forth. And uh, you wrote about how during the Red Scare, uh, according to your, your book, fear of political replies will put teachers and administrators on the offensive forcing them to exercise, to excise any curricula and remain silent on any topics that could be deemed remotely controversial to protect their jobs and reputation. But by, by chance, by chance, might there be any parallel? You know, it's, it's funny, we were talking about how I did, did the recording last spring, um, and uh, Oh my God, there's so many more examples. So many more examples from even just that time. Um, between like the Don't Say Gay, the bills, the anti-CRT bills. Um, and uh, it's really, really disheartening um, what's, what's happening. And the self-censorship that teachers are having to go through now. Um, and there are kind of remarkable parallels um, to, to the Red Scare in this. I mean, I used to be, um, uh, I was at the College of Charleston, and you know, we had a situation where a state legislator requested the syllabi of all U.S. history classes. And so I just submitted my syllabi, no reason given, um, but this is the type of environment uh, that we are in again. So I think that when, when you're gonna get our, again, the kind of back channels, so even if you're not gonna get things in, you know, or you're going to have challenges in classrooms. I mean, this is, again, where libraries are so important. But they're under attack, too. So it's like everybody is under attack. Um, but again, like, what would be other ways of um, getting information out there? This is kind of diverging a little bit from folk music, but uh, there's a really great book called Learning from the Left. 
And it's all about um, authors, like blacklisted authors, and who um, couldn't get jobs, you know, writing a, you know, adult books or anything, or textbooks or anything that got a lot of scrutiny. So they went into trades books and children's books. So uh, this is where you get books like, you know, Harold and the Purple Crayon, which is written by a blacklisted author. And like, so I think that there's still ways to uh, challenge the status quo, uh, even if you can't necessarily do it directly in a classroom. There's still going to be uh, people who will, yeah, will, will challenge what's happening. But it's, it's tough. So Frank, yeah. my husband John took lessons at the Chicago school when he was a teenager. He just turned 70, so whatever math tells you, that's when he would have done it. And, uh, but he wouldn't have been there. It would have been after you left. So Kismet had it that we would move to Atlanta. I met him, John, in Minneapolis, and then he had a job down here, so we moved to Atlanta. And Kismet had it that. Here's the School of Folk Music in Atlanta. So we were both able to take it full circle. I'm a pianist, but I took jazz, or swing uke from you, <laughs> for a couple sessions. Oh, yeah, that's right. I don't expect you, it was pre-pandemic. And then John took the more advanced swing guitar from you. Talk about being jazzed when you get home. <laughs> And before, even before we moved down here, we always had jam sessions in the living room, like after Thanksgiving or whatever. The joy of gathering is what you brought to, you reminded us of that, because could you talk about the second half? And does that go all the way to the beginning of the school, the jazz, or uh, Chicago school? Because yeah, that know. is the magic, that, that, that seals the experience. Yeah, when, when and I discussed it, uh, actually, it was a kind of it was kind of an offshoot of, of where I was coming from, from Beslaws and teaching in classes and getting people to play and sing together. So we said, well, let's let's get all the students in the school together in the second half, and let's uh, let's have them play the same song at different levels, different skill levels, and see if they could blend. It. And they did. And it it works it yeah. because you're sitting in the class book well, talking to the choir here because i bet half of you all <laughs> do the second half but i don't sing and we get into that second half and i'm just going yeah you are my sunshine right. and and you come alive and yes. and there were there were some youngins in there and when we talk about passing it on and i got to say you lit up a little bit more when they walked in the room. So thank you. Oh, listen, hey. Uh, uh, listen. Frank, uh, Frank we, didn't, we didn't have airtime in the film to really get into your love for and proficiency in jazz very much. Uh, but could you talk a little bit about the intersection of, of folk and jazz? Well, it's all part of the big, big picture, you know? Folk music is a tributary of, uh, of American music. American music is comes from various sources uh, and, and from other countries, as we all do. We all have ancestors from different places, and they bring their music with us, with them, and it's incorporated into American music. Jazz is folk music. It is folk music, because it starts off with, uh, my very first record uh, that I bought was uh, Bunk Johnson, George Lewis, and uh, Big Jim Robinson, and, uh, Lawrence Barrero playing the banjo, and uh, Slow Drag Papago playing the bass. And it was down by the riverside from New Orleans. So New Orleans jazz is folk music. It comes right out of folk songs. And this line of demarcation, this is folk or this is not folk, doesn't make any sense. It's all music, and it's all our music. It's all American music. And we have every right to be proud of it and be part of it. Yes, sir. Uh, and the question, how do we get going again? When Bert and I started talking about this, um, we had no idea how to finance or anything like that. But it didn't stop Bert. You can't imagine the amount of hours that man put in. Yeah. 
to make the sound and the pictures meld like that and have the quality good. Absolutely. But uh, you just do it. There's a couple of guys, and there's one guy right there, he said, you just do it. At least with it. Invites people over to her neighborhood to sing with her. Mm -hmm. I ask people over to my house every Friday, come play jazz. You know, a bunch of beginners, but we play together, some of the people are here. And quite often, Frank Hamilton comes and visits us. So I think the answer is always immediate. Nobody else is going to do it. Mm. We don't have saviors. This is my dear friend, by the way, Dave McCullough. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, it's a wonderful organizer. And he has the best well, international, international folk music parties yes. ever. He invites people from their tradition to come by. We've heard some wonderful uh, Bulgarian music, we heard some Russian music, we heard uh, some, uh, 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 oh, just any any international music. It was at Dave's house, and he cultivated this. Well, and he's start, doing the same thing for jazz. Where you are, you start with the people that are next to you on the job, okay? In your family, whatever, and bring them together. You can do it. Everybody can do it. And, and Dave did do it, way and it's it. wonderful. If you're lucky to be invited to a party at Dave's, don't pass it up. Uh, Frank, I mean, uh, Bert, uh, what was your greatest challenge in, in doing the sound design uh, for this film? Well, how long have you got? <laughs> no, not long, apparently, but we'll see how I'm getting it. Well, first of all, uh, most of the underscoring that was done in the film uh, is Frank. And a number of times he'd come over to the house and he'd just be sitting there picking and uh, I'd be in record. Um, and I'd just let him go. And you might have noticed that some of the background banjo stuff was just jamming with itself. There was no form, but uh, the challenge was to make it sound like it had form. And that was probably the biggest part. But uh, the, the best part of, of, of the track was making Frank's music uh, be there with him. And, uh, you know, the part uh, I want to mention, because not a lot of people know this about Frank, but the, the section you may have noticed where that music comes from, it sounded so weird under the section where it was talking about Woody and Pete. And um, Frank's written a couple symphonies. Uh -huh. And uh, the way I kind of got involved, and got deeper into Frank's music was because he called me up and said, Bert, I can't figure out where all my stuff is on my hard drive. So I went over there and, and uh, tried to organize his years of ideas that he's throwing down and put them together and um, and out of that I discovered some songs that I couldn't believe how great they were and in fact we have recorded a number of them now and plan on uh, releasing an album hopefully in conjunction with the, uh, with the documentary. <laughs> That section in particular are excerpts from his symphonies that he just did with keyboard MIDI and stuff like that. Uh, I just thought it was great. And, um, but you know, the, it's, it's a joy because working with all these guys, but especially Frank and, and, and Rachel, and, uh, uh, it's, it, it, there's no challenge really. It's, you know, it's what we do. <laughs> Thank you. We do need to wrap it up. Thanks so much. I want to say yes. one thing. Bert is a fine musician yes. and a performer yes. and a songwriter. Yes. He's really deeply involved in music and is quite good at it. Thanks so much to the Frank Hamilton School, to Mara, and all of our volunteers, our African volunteers. Thanks to the panel so much. Thanks to you for coming out. Uh, interviewees like John McCutcheon. And thank you, Frank, for all that you have been and are and continue to be and continue to do. Oh, Chris, I'm just a lucky guy. Thank you all.